going today. I'm Tom Lamog. I am uh, an instructor with the Cyber Chapter in the Guitars for Vets Learning Center here with Challenge America Veteran Arts Community. It's great to have you today. Um, right now I'd like to introduce you to our show's co-host Daniel B. Daniel, how's it going? Hey Tom. Good Hi to Tom. Have you back, my friend. There are a lot of topics out there. The last time that we met up we started to build a list. We, I mean, we really started to add our list of things as to what we want to go ahead and talk about. What you know, is it any? Is it easy to go ahead and identify these topics for guitar shop? It, it's a lifelong study, Tom. I mean, it's been something I've been doing for. I'm not going to say because I'll give away my age. Several years, let's say, and in those several years, many subjects have come up. Many subjects I had to learn as I was a beginner to where I am now. Uh, it, it's just such a fascinating instrument when it really comes down to it. And whatever you can uh, think of, whatever sounds you may want your guitar to do, uh, it, it's it's out there. It is. And, you know, we are a community of maybe 1,100 guitar players right now and we consistently see about no oh, maybe one two hundred people show up and everyone has their own ideas of things that they want to talk about so when we um here at guitars for vets the learning center put together these shows we know there are like a million things we can talk about but today what we're going to focus on will be strings guitar strings Boing. guitars yeah um we're also <laughs> going to be covering tuners and yeah, it doesn't sound like a real fun topic to discuss, but we're going to make it interesting for you. We're going to show you some some tuners that are out in the market, um, demonstrate a couple of them that you may not have known about, including the ghost tuner that Dan's showing. <laughs> we're going to talk about capos. Went to the NAMM show uh, not too long ago and met up with Kaiser, one of the vendors. They're the same ones actually put uh, a capo out there with the Guitars for Vets name on it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then our director of online learning, Paul Lilly, is going to take us through the new guitar player's toolkit that you'll want to definitely know more about. <laughs> Let me go ahead and bring on board uh, our panelists. Hey, Randy Boucher is here. How's it going, Randy? Good to I'm see you. I'm doing good. Yes. Doing good. Yes, yes, I know. Hey, Rich, thanks for joining us again. You know, thanks you for letting me in. in. You know, it, it, you added a lot of the technical stuff from the from last month. It's great to see just you, geek. Joel Grant. Joel Grant mm -hmm. is with us. He's uh, joining us as a panelist as well too. He was he's one of our instructors, and featuring left-handed guitar playing. Got to have all perspectives here, so we've asked him to come along, and of course our fearless leader. Hey there, <laughs> how's it going, Paul? He's it. It's the boss. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. Um, first of all, let me bring up for the topic of strings. You know, Dan had put out um, a couple of important polls, um, and some of you may have participated in that. But let's go ahead and take a look at that first poll. And that first poll, like this, if you are on the Guitars for Vets Learning Center page, you should see, you know, the, 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 what is the criteria for looking for acoustic guitar strings. Yeah, the all of the above was the one that actually made it to the top. Uh, Brand, I think that a lot of us are uh, kind of specific. Some of us are more experienced players. Uh, and that happens after, you know, you've been playing for a while. Uh, you, you get used to a certain brand. Maybe you started out with that brand and it carried on through your life. And then gauge thickness, and I put up a poll about gauge thickness, and there's different aspects to that, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But gauge thickness, and uh, that's also important to me, being a lead guitar player and a slide guitar player. I have 
you know, various requirements for my string gauges. So we'll talk more about that as we go on. All right. Well, so um, there were some comments that were made. Some of them were specific to this is the, the brand that I use. And now I'm going to just open this up to the panel. Are you stuck on a single brand? I stick with Ernie Ball. Ernie Ball, yeah. I use those too. Oh, I like those. Yeah, is that the... Uh... The, the thinner the better. I like light gauge. Joel, you, you I got to uh, use the Diodario, mm -hmm. but a lot of times uh, I go to the manufacturer side and see what strings they uh, put on the guitar at the factory. Then I try those for a bit, and then if they sound good, I, I stick with them. If they don't, I I change it up. What is it that you <laughs> like about those Diodarios? I don't know. They just seem to ring out with the uh, with the guitars that that I have and. Uh, for my uh, electric guitar, the Telecaster, I like to use the Diodario 11, so they work really good uh, for, for my setup. Dan. Yeah, um, I, I agree with Joel. I love those Diodarios, uh, but my uh, I have a guy that helps me out with changing my strings and stuff, uh, doing my setups. And he'll throw me a curveball every once in a while and shoot me a different type of string. Um, right now, I have a 12 string that has the nano webs, the elixirs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of liking them. Uh, they sound really good. They're very bright. Uh, they are a thin gauge. They're a 10 gauge. Uh, and uh, I've all, he's also snuck in some of the earthwood. I don't know. Let's see. That's that's Elixir, right? Or is that its own brand? <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm not sure. It's not a Diodario, but he threw it on uh, one of my six-string acoustics. I'm mm -hmm. kind of liking them. They're okay, but I'm going to go back to the Diodario 10s for acoustic. Um, oh, and as uh, Joel was mentioning about the uh, brands, certain brands have certain strings made. Martin, believe it or not, their strings are made to their specs by Diodario. You know, you find that a lot of manufacturers have other people manufacturing their strings. Yeah. Um, so I experiment a lot because I'm half tone deaf anyway, I guess. But I, sometimes I can't tell the difference. I worry more about gauge, I think, than, than manufacturer. But the ads have got so many available, and they give you a good description of what each string sounds like. Unfortunately, it sounds differently on different guitars and it depends on how you play. When you first purchase your guitar and they come with a set of strings, so um, for instance, Taylor will, I believe Taylor goes with the Elixirs, Martin goes with their own brand. Because you probably, you probably fall in love with the tone that comes from that Ooh. guitar, you know, based on those guitar strings that, uh, that Taylor or Martin might have put on them. Is that, is that important to you guys? I stick with uh, for the Martin on my Martin. So I'm a dabbler. I experiment. <laughs> and Rich Younger, the manufacturer's spe specified strings are for sure the first go to for him. So he, I, I'm Rich. I'm guessing that that was uh, Rich Younger. I believe that's. Uh, I hope I communicated that correctly. <clears throat> you mentioned a Taylor. Back when I got my Taylor. They were some sort of a Diodario thing, so it's a net with uh, coating on them, and that's what I use every time that guitar gets set up. But now, did you did you did you really like the tone that came with the guitar when you bought it, and you decided you want to stick with? The yeah, guitar? when I when I was shopping for the for the higher end acoustic, the Taylor, uh, the two fourteen, I fell in love with the guitar the way it was. And then, you know, some people say, oh, I always put these get these strings on, I always get these strings on. And those same people are always ones shopping for newer guitars. So I figured the Taylor comes with the, I don't remember the strings on them. I don't have my memory's not that good. But uh, every time I go to that guitar, I know what to expect, and it's good, and I like it. And I haven't bought another new acoustic since. Very good. Hey, by the way, that's like a number of cases behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a guitar player? <laughs> That's those are my Epiphones. So I'm a big Epiphone mm -hmm. guy. Okay. But then, Paul, I think we need to talk to him about teaching. 
So yeah. this closet over here, I don't know, I can't see the camera thing. Oh my goodness. Oh, okay. Good grief. That's crap in over there too. Hmm. All I can say to that is, uh, Dan, I think we've got our next show lined up. <laughs> I think so, man. <laughs> we'll just do a show on, on Rich Yonkers on guitar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the thing with strings, um, I definitely have a go-to capo that I like and a go-to tuner, but when it comes to strings, for me, it's kind of like picks. I can never settle on a pick. Depending on what week it is, I have a favorite pick, and some of that is the different thicknesses and the different feels. Um, I really like experimenting with strings. I've been playing around with um, String Joys. They're a new, new company out of Tennessee, I believe. Yep. Um, Part of that is kind of what Rich was talking about. If you have a, regardless of what strings, if you have a Martin guitar and a Taylor guitar and you strum an E chord, the Martin body and the Taylor body are gonna do so much to that sound. And for me, the Taylors tend to favor the higher registers, the higher, the mids and the highs. And that Martin really wants to bring out, I have a, a larger body Martin. And so it brings out the, the lower end of it. And so strings for me, like the elixirs, which are known to kind of be bright, I don't necessarily want that on my tailor. And so a lot of it, it's just subject, subjective. A lot of it is personal preference, but I do like playing around with the different strings. I, I noticed with two of my guitars that had elixirs, I don't know if this was just mine. Now I always forget because they have the nano web and something else web, but those are the poly coatings on it that it started to flake, like I was getting a tiny little gold flex where my fretting fingers were on the acoustic guitar. Um, and it, they both were elixir sets of strings. So I don't know, I didn't I didn't like that, but. It, you either love them or you hate them. That's at least the right. guitar players that I've come to. There's a guitar player that I knew who said, absolutely not, no coded strings whatsoever. And I, I never asked him why, but I think what you're talking about, Paul, um, yeah, probably answers that question. Mike Manchester asked a very uh, pertinent question, uh, and it was, uh, do you need to worry about damage to the guitar if you go with the weight difference from manufacturer put on that the manufacturer put on? I, I'm assuming that's what you meant, sir. It can make a difference. It uh, it can change your intonations. It can just change the 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 action on your guitar. Sometimes you may have to, you know, make adjustments accordingly. Uh, but that's all I got on that. Uh, I thought, Mike, is if that's helpful. Yeah, we got a couple more questions to you. But before we get to your questions, let me go ahead and uh, share this sample. Now, this is um, uh, a video that Premier Guitar, the magazine, did. And uh, what we'll do is we're going to take 60 seconds just to take a listen. They're going to they're going to run through a number of different set of strings. So there's a, just a sample of some of the different strings that are available out there. But to, yeah, what are your thoughts? I mean, you, could you hear the difference? Can you hear the difference from the different types of strings, the different um, metals that are used? I think, Tom, when it comes to the different types of metals, uh, it's uh, how they last, for one. It helps. And what they're constructing they're made out of, whether they're nickel or stainless steel or just steel. Um, then there's, you know, you have the, the content with the phosphorus bronze or the 8020s, which are, I, if I remember right, bronze and steel. Um, you know what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask Bruce Bjork if his opinions on this subject. There I you. have 
I, I can't remember the strings. This is a Gill that I bought in 1967. It's a D40. Um, I've, and I also play banjo and dobro, pedal steel. So I've, I've, I've experienced all kinds of strings. Uh, but for my, for my D40, I've, I've really kind of landed on these Martin authentic acoustic phosphor bronze. They're, they're lights. They're 12 to 54s. Um, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many different strings I've used, but this is this is what I really like. Um, I can't, rem I mean, and I change my strings like every six every six weeks or so on all of my instruments. Uh, you know, two banjos, dobro, pedal steel. Um, I also save my used strings because a friend of mine, his her, his wife, makes jewelry out of used guitar strings. We never really uh, touched on nylon strings and we happen to have someone who actually plays nylon is probably if not more as much as steel strings but uh jorge moya who is um uh one of our instructors as well too jorge why don't you go ahead and unmute and then um let's yeah so you've been playing nylon string guitars for a while maybe you can tell us a little bit about your experience with uh with nylon guitars nylon string guitars uh, nylon guitars uh, normally are meant to be uh, strummed. Uh, I use a real light pick if I need to strum my uh, nylon guitar. Normally I stay uh, to finger picking. Um, most of my teaching is with the uh, nylon guitar. Um, on the, the nylon strings, I, I um, have used the uh, normal and hard tension. The normal are kind of vibrate more depending um on how hard you know you you either pull them when you're uh, finger picking or um you know they they tend they tend to last uh um less than the than the hard tension uh nylon guitar strings right now on this one i have a i have a hard tension on hard tension and so it gives a little bit more brighter sound. The soft tensions, I don't have, I don't really get soft tension. It's kind of a lower tone. It's almost like a when you get a, an acoustic guitar and you, let's say, you put on a, a tens. Uh, a ten is gonna be really different from a twelve. Uh, and and I think somebody was asking about the finger picking. Um, and relating to the acoustic guitar, on um, if you use twelve, it's kind of harder to finger pick on acoustic guitar. Is it true like the the flamenco players, if you're playing flamenco, like to have the lighter gauge, or is it? Um, I have taught a student of uh, flamenco, and I used the uh, hard tension. Do you um, I had to modify um, modify one of the songs to just three chords. Um, it was no no uh, vocals in the song, um, just uh, just uh, chords. And uh, normally the the these guitars, the nylon guitars, and the one you see in the background, this in the background. The reason why I have it on display is because it has a little crack in the neck. And that guitar, let me uh, modify. That guitar um, has actually passed down by from my dad, and he bought it uh, at a pawn shop. And this guitar is from uh, Mexico. It's made in uh, Mexico. Um, and this guitar, I played it, but that guitar um, is kind of a uh, harder uh, strung because of the uh, of the little crack that it has on the on on right here. So I got this one, the Palmer, and this one. Uh, Sound, sounds the same, but on on uh, nylon guitars, it's just a preference. It has to be more finger picking, my my opinion. Then uh, with a pick, it's uh, actually uh, sounds better to me with the finger picking. Uh, there's a lot of metally uh, met metally uh, involved with the finger picking. A lot of uh, different things. You know, you can do blues or country or anything. All right, thanks, Jorge. We appreciate that. Yeah. Hey, Jorge, no one last question for you, Jorge. Do you do you have any tips for um for the community about purchasing nylon strings? Any favorite? Um, my experience. I based it on my experience. I would start. Um, I use Martin. 
Um, with the ball end on, on the guitar, no, we can see this one is not stringed like the other, uh, let me bring closer, like the other nylon guitars, they have that ball, like the acoustic. And to me, that's actually easier, um, okay. actually easier for the guitar. You don't have to tie, unless you're like a fly fisherman who knows how to tie knots. <laughs> Because <laughs> they make those too without the ball end, right? Yeah. So Tom, what you're saying is, if, if you got a hook and and a guitar, you can just whip that sucker off and use I've your seen guitar that. as a pole. Well, like that one, you can. See I like the... that. Very good. Yeah, that that's the that's the the weaving I had to do on the on yeah. the other guitar that I displayed on the wall. that I'm familiar with. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Jorge. Thank you. Thank you yeah, so much for uh, for stepping us through the world of nylon strings on guitar and such. Let us go ahead and continue uh, to our next topic, and that would be uh, tuners. This is um, not a real popular topic. Uh, it's kind of like, yeah, get a tuner, tune your strings, big deal. Well, we you can some... tune a guitar, but you can't tune a fish. <laughs> was that Jay Guy? <laughs> I don't remember who that was. Ario Speedwagon. Oh, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. Hey, um, so panel to the panel, um, what type of tuner do you use and what are some of the features in that tuner? Do you use the famous snark, but doesn't have a whole lot to it or something a little more detailed? Who wants to start? Okay, Joel, go ahead. What, what you got? Oh, uh, for, uh, for my uh, electrics, or if I plug in uh, acoustic electric, I use the the mod tone uh, tuner. Just that's push a pedal. it. That's a, it's a floor pedal. It's a floor pedal. Yeah, runs on. Uh, I it's a nine volt. I just plug it in with my other string of pedals, and you just push on it. Make sure your volume's up on your uh, guitar, and uh, just whatever tuning you're using, tune it to it. It'll come up, and it'll show. Uh, the note that you got on there that is tuned to. I got a, a, a very popular snark. They've been around quite a while now, and I imagine they're probably one of the best sellers. It's pretty simple. And I also use the phone, Joel. It works very well for me. Uh, one of the things I've found with these is back in the old days when they didn't have them, uh, we'd be in a band practice arguing about who's out, who's out of tune. This solved that, finally. Everybody can be on a standard tuning, which you got to have. Now, does it does it actually um, change the reference pitch? Because um, you, you hear about, I, for those of you who may have seen the article um, that's posted on the G4V Learning Center about reference pitch, um, some of these tuners are adjustable. You can actually change, you know, the reference pitch, the, the, the amount, the number of hertz. Maybe a tune. Yeah, the, the, the. So the one that I have, it's a polymorphic tuner. And um, it's a TC Helicon puts one together. Uh, and I, I don't have this on my guitar right now, but I do have a video demonstration. It has the polyphonic tuning. So when you strum all the strings, you can see all the strings simultaneously. And if they're all green, then that means they're in tune. And anywhere that is red above or below is that it's either sharp or flat. So you can go into that string and just tune it up. The second functionality of tuning it has is chromatic. So just pick one string and it will show you the note and whether it's in tune. I feel like that's how most people tune their guitars. Um, and it has that. And also the tuner knows automatically whether you are strumming all the strings or whether you're just strumming one and it'll show you chromatic. So that's kind of handy. The polytune clip is super responsive. It has a really quick response time when you pluck the string. It doesn't take forever to think about whether a string is in tune or not. So I like that a lot. The last functionality is called strobe and it is millimetric tuning. So if you want a really, really, really accurate, even more accurate than the polyphonic or the chromatic, then you can switch to strobe and that is gonna be absolute fine-tuning if you want to see more about this uh, TC Helicon is the one who who creates uh, this tuner some really neat things it's about 50 bucks but I'll tell you um, the, the one thing that they didn't mention in this um, is the ability to change the reference pitch um, you have the ability to use this tuner 
to change um, the reference pitch. Uh, not all tuners are able to do that, but this one does for sure. Paul, you've got one that you want to share. Sound hole tuner from Diodario. Oh, yeah. A little, little clip on it. Uh, so I never have to worry about, did I bring my my tuner with me? It just clips into the sound hole of it. And while you're holding it in plank position, you could position the little window. Uh, and it seems to be very responsive. So I kind of like that one. So I'll go old tech and then I'll go new tech if that's all right. This is old tech. And maybe you can give a little backstory as to, you know, when you were introduced to using the tool that you're going to show us and, and uh, help people have it so easy now. This is a, a Planet Waves tuning fork. Obviously, this would be my low tech option. No uh, batteries, no plugs, no strings. And this is very common for um, instruments, stringed instruments. It gives you one note and one note only. Now you could buy ones that produce another single note, but it's relationship. When this is bumped, these two rods are vibrating at a certain rate, which gives us the note. So this is an A. I think it is the 440A. They call it the concert A. And the idea is on your guitar, obviously there's a bunch of different ways you could do this. And what, what, while this is very nice and simple, what is tough is, you know, you only got two hands, so I'll show you how to use this in a minute. But you need this note vibrating out after you tap it, and then you got to get one hand on your tuner and one hand fretting the note that you want to play. So because it's an A, we could certainly tune to the fifth fret of the E string. We could tune to the open A string. We could tune to the seventh fret of the D string. In other words, you'd be finding A notes. Or... You could just get this first one tuned using the tuning fork and then use the fifth fret method to do the rest. So um, I hope this comes out. The idea is when this is vibrating, um, you won't be able to hear this. The idea is you would vibrate it and they would either hold it up to their ear. So I'm hearing an A note that I can now... I could work on my guitar to sound it and then, uh, in fact, I'll put this one out of tune to show you that. But for you to hear it, I'm gonna uh, do this in steps here. I'm gonna try and get you to hear this vibration. And Tom said I have to do it on my kneecap, so. That's right, slam it on your kneecap. That's how I was taught. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you should be hearing just a slight little a note mm -hmm. and what the guitarist would be doing is while that is ringing out on their guitar i'm going to use the low e string as an example so i'm flat actually let me do the the open string because then i don't have to juggle as much so i'm going to tune my a tuning fork to my a string And you can hear it snap in. It's almost like, you know, that sweet spot. So take it on camping trips when you don't have cell reception, I guess. No batteries required either. <laughs> yeah. Now we'll go high tech. I have, um, I think it's a 2017 Gibson Les Paul standard. And it has the Robo Force tuners on it. There's a couple generations. This is an earlier generation. I think they came out in 15. So I think this is generation two. And this is, uh, I guess, the beginning of introducing AI to our guitar playing. Now I'm gonna kind of do this a little backwards so that you can see the headstock, I'm hoping. What I'm gonna do is obviously what this does, um, there's a little, a little battery in here that, uh, it's charged. This thing lasts forever. I mean, it says it lasts a thousand charges or a thousand tunes, but it seems to be even more than that. So the battery goes in. And then there's going to be a color coding system with these letters when I first turn it on. Uh, I'm in standard, I'm in open G tuning right now. So when I turn it on, it's waiting to hear me vibrate the strings before it turns the tuning head. So I'm going to do that now. Wow. 
So when I get them all green, it's happy. And when I go, the open tunings are a little bit more demanding on it. When I'm in standard tuning, it does it a little bit easier than that. That's spooky. I don't know if you can see that. It, it's not the best lighting, but it's kind of putting them in tune. You could hear, I could hear grinding as they're turning them. We so now it's it. telling me the two E's are out of tune. So if I just pick those individually instead of all of the strings, it'll let me know when I'm in tune. Now it's telling me what is that, the G string. So it's, that's one of the things that it took some heat for. It's not like you're real quick with the tuning, but it is pretty, it's pretty accurate. I mean, once it settles in, it's really having trouble with that E string. So for a guitar where you want to use altered tunings and you're doing like in a cover band, you got just, you know, 30 seconds between songs. It's really nice when it's working. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> one of the drawbacks, one of the drawbacks is the gear ratio on this thing is so um, like if it's not really meant to be played, like if it's turned off, you can still use it. But the gear ratio turning is so minimal that like if you were to tune this without using this, you're cranking it much more than you would on a normal guitar because it's very, very precise with the oh. gear ratio. Wow. Uh, Rich has the real ancient. <laughs> oh, it's not the so real ancient. ancient tuner. This one reminds me of my kindergarten teacher. Okay, here we go. <laughs> well, since I couldn't afford to buy a harmonica, I was taught how to use a <laughs> use this little guy. And what this is is a pitch pipe. So it's got it. It the screens in there are uh, set to to the tone for each string. <laughs> And I'm not good at using that because you got to hold it, and play it, at the same time you're tuning. But I'm mm. glad they don't use them anymore. But this handy little thing, it doesn't take batteries. And, Rich, uh, it's, yes. Rich, we should go out on tour with your pipe and my tuning fork. We should, <laughs> huh? Show people how we did it Only in good old days. we could use. <laughs> yeah. um, and then another real quickie, one that I use in my shop, is called the strobe tuner. Oh, um, mm. a little bit pricey. Um, you see, yeah, um, but it you can adjust it to any of the pitch standards. Uh, it'll and it'll sense whatever note you're playing on any instrument, um, and it's it's almost too sensitive. You can't hum while you're tuning because it'll pick up the loudest tone. So I'm since I'm always off tune off key, um, it it tries to tell me to tune my voice rather than the strings. But anyways, this is a real handy tool. It's good for the shop. Not too portable for gigs. Um, it's kind of bulky and heavy, and it's a little expensive, so you don't want it getting spilled with beer or, or kicked on the stage. But uh, there's several, it's fairly new, the strobe concept, um, but they're really accurate. So it, it's kind of fun to have in the shop. I knew, a guy okay. that had, I knew a guy that had one that was about the size of a pig nose amp, but standing up, oh, and it had multiple dials and it was black and white and if you used it in the fourth set <laughs> by the time the fourth set came around it was really hard to line up that strobe <laughs> hey got a question here for both. can an electric guitar be tuned both while plugged in or not Paul, maybe you want to take that one. Since you yeah, I, I, I answer in the chat that if you're using a tuner like a snark that's reading the vibration, your electric guitar doesn't have to be plugged in. Some of the pedals require the quarter inch jack to be with your uh, guitar and in and on. Um, it just depends. So if they're the tuners like the Polytune that Tom showed, the snarks, all of those that you could clip on. And some of those you could choose a microphone setting or vibration. So if it's working off vibration, uh, you could certainly tune your electric guitar without plugging in, which my wife asked me to do all the time. Show of hands in the gallery, how many people use their phones? For yeah. sure. They got the apps out now. That's for sure. It's so much easier to do than uh, having to dig up one with a battery. Oh, <laughs> OK, hey, let's move on um, to capos. Um, Capos, this is the third topic um, of the essential accessories. 
And um, let me go ahead and start first by saying, uh, you know, Guitars for Vets actually went into a agreement with Kaiser, the manufacturer, to have one made. And um, if you, you know, if you're looking for a capo, maybe uh, check out the one with Guitars for Vets on it. It's right there. <laughs> But if you don't, you know, Kaiser um, had a chance to talk to them at their booth uh, at the NAM show. And it's, uh, you know, different colors. You know, there are uh, a number of six string acoustic type of, um, of these capos. And I found that the big difference between, you know, the, the types of capos that they offer has been primarily, you know, the function of it. There are some that they've created. Um, that only cover just partial partial coverage of the six strings. Like for instance, some of them cover five. And that um, is something that Paul introduced me to is that actually you could do drop detuning with taking a capo that only covers the five strings. There is also another capo that, that will do dad get. It'll only cover three strings and you just have to you know use that three string capo um, for, for that type of a tuning. But they also had a 12 string acoustic, uh, classical. Uh, they do, it seems like they've got everyone covered uh, in the types of capos for the different types of guitars. The one thing that I found was interesting is that um, it really has to do with the tension. You can't necessarily use a capo meant for acoustic on an electric. Yeah, they do make electric guitar capos and uh, the tension is just, uh, it's too great on those electric guitars and vice versa. May not be um, really enough pressure to apply on those acoustics if it's if it's made for um, an electric. So, what are your thoughts, guys? What else do you got out there for for uh, for capos? Me, 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 me. So, Dan, what's up? All so, right, let me uh, <clears throat> share my screen here. Just a just a smidge of the types that are out there. Okay, everybody, see my pointer moving around. Mm -hmm. The cheapest one is right here. I mean, the least expensive one, I should say, not the cheapest. The least expensive. I remember having one of these when I first started out playing guitar. Uh, kind of was like what was all only available, and it's actually elastic. The banding with adjustments on it. And, you know, you, it had three holes, and you kind of hoped that the middle hole was enough. Um, of course, you had the Kaiser. And these are the G7s, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Diodario has these types. Uh, it's uh, a, a kind of like a fulcrum, I guess they call it, something similar to that. Work very well when you're having that buzzing issue because you can make the adjustment yourself by turning the knob. Uh, these are page and also G7 also makes a style like these. Uh, these this gate actually opens and you put it over the top of your neck. Takes a little bit of time to get it on and adjust it. And it's the same with these type. Um, Planet Waves, I think it was, that made these. Uh, they're a little uh, strange because you can't, re you know, can't really put them on your neck and make it whole because this bottom piece has to be open in order to get it up onto your guitar, and it's it's a nightmare. And of course, the old trigger type, which is the type I like to use because they're quick and easy, just like the Kaiser. No, so the, I play the dobro, and the, the the strings are about a half an inch, or you know, maybe a quarter of it. You know, there's there's no there's a lot of space between the strings. So so the 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 dobro capo actually pinches the strings, and kind of hard, to, you know. Um, what it does is it capos it up, and then with this, you know, you push this in, and and it clamps it so you're you're not capoing it down you're basically capoing it up it's kind of unusual cool. yeah this this is a worthless tuner as far as i'm concerned or not a tuner but a capo uh, the thing that's neat about it 
I've never actually used it, but you can. You mount your camera on it. You mount your iPhone on it. And then you can see your fingers or you can put it on you while you're singing or something like that. The crazy thing, I got it as like a a, a joke present was given to me for that reason. It was They gave it to me as a fun present. But it's a... Uh, it's kind of neat, neat idea. Put a yeah, camera you, right on your, you, you your guitar. For, do you use that for lyrics or you could for a you selfie? Could. <laughs> so, so. Yeah. Do you find that spider capo? Yeah, I think I, I think I'm all set to kind of bring this up. I hope. Um, okay. Really quick, this is one that's uh, a pretty interesting. It's called the spider. Everybody see that? Mm-hmm. All right. Does it, does okay. I got a little short uh, video that will show it. Open the end piece wider than your guitar neck by unscrewing the knob. Place the white tab on top of the fingerboard just behind the desired fret and tighten until finger tight. With all four tabs flush on top of the fingerboard, twist the knob to tighten securely. Soft leather protects your neck. Use the little nub or finger handle to align the fingers over the strings and rotate the finger to capo whatever string you want. Hey, listen, we are almost out of time here. It's uh, at the top of the hour. We wanted to give Paul a few minutes to talk about the new Guitar Players Toolkit. And there is, um, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of good information for all skill levels of guitar players in the toolkit itself. And it's a, uh, Something that Paul has worked really hard on for these last several months. Paul, you want to tell us about the, the guitar? I would love to. Kit? Yep. And while I'm doing this, Tom, can I inconvenience you to share screen and just kind of go to the modules and more so we can at least see the sections of it? I wrote the toolkit for one purpose, and that was uh, I believe that any beginning guitar player can create music, period. So. This isn't necessarily like a deep dive on songwriting. It is really trying to encourage any beginning guitar player can pick up the guitar and create music. You don't need X number of lessons. You don't need an X number of knowledge of theory. You don't need X years of playing experience. All of that, by the way, helps accelerate maybe you creating music, but a beginning guitar player can begin to create chord progressions, instrumentals, and songs if they're into writing lyrics. So when I say a beginning guitar player, I'm kind of differentiating a novice, which is someone brand new. They have to go through the callus stage. They have to go through the mechanics of fretting. They have to learn a couple strum patterns. A beginning guitar player would be someone like we graduate from our program. So they got 10 hours in, they have a chord library, maybe a few strum patterns, um, and we're targeting it to that. But there is a lot of information in here for the late beginner and even intermediate guitar players. I learned a ton while I was creating it. And the analogy I really like, since we're all about music, music is an art form and it's very subjective as art usually is. And the way I like to kind of think about it in the introduction of the toolkit, we talk about your skills and experience being the white canvas, the chords and notes being the colors that you have to work with, and your guitar is a paintbrush. And so these first few sections, and the, this program isn't meant to go consecutively, it's actually like a toolkit. You'd open up a toolkit and you'd reach in for whatever it is you think you wanna work on. So don't let the order starting with capos think you have to take this as a series, but those first four capos, the chord progression formula, the notes and numbering, inviting the in-laws. This is all giving you kind of knowledge that helps you understand, to go back to the analogy, your colors, how you would use your colors, what colors work good together, i.e. what chords fit together in a family. That's that second chapter there. That fourth chapter is looking at uh, chords outside of the family. And that was a, a great one for us to, to, for me to kind of learn on. There's so many songs I loved that I would hear a chord progression and I wouldn't know what that was. And now I, I have some context for it. Uh, you guys mentioned the capo hack in capos. We actually have some demonstrations of that. We have Mike Kelly, one of our G4V instructors from Sacramento doing last train to Clarksville using that capo hack. Uh, we've tried to make it very visual. 
very video based. There's a lot of PDF resources available. And the second half that starts with music is emotion, let's create some music that's really around picking up the guitar and beginning to create. Um, we really talk that, that there's a deep dive kind of on this music is emotion where we start to introduce the idea of tension and resolution with individual notes and then with chords. So we use the five, seven back to the one is kind of the, the beginning doorway to understand tension. And then we go into all these beautiful chord progressions that create all these different types of emotions. Um, the let's create music is kind of fun because we start with some rules. Follow these three rules and you could start right away. And then the next section is break some of these rules and you could do this. And then the third section is what if you were to do it with no rules? And so we think there's many, many paths to creating art, creating music with your guitar. We're not selling one path to you. Um, so we kind of have fun with looking at different ways just to get you started, just to get you picking up the guitar. And if this is something you're interested in, creating original music, original chord progressions, uh, the Let's Create Music goes into some detail around creating a motif, uh, what, what that would be if you're just doing an instrumental. Um, and then we end with kind of this, how do you keep your, how do you not lose your mojo? I think we called it uh, creating, stoking your creative process. A lot of the information, a lot of the material from this came from interviews that uh, Tom and I were able to do with three professional guitar players. We spent some time with Scotty Hastings and Jesse Freard and um, Ben Morrow, and we asked them directly, how do you create music? Do you do lyrics first? Do you do chord, chord progressions? How do you stay motivated? And so you'll see throughout the series, there's little snippets of those interviews that we use. So this is kind of information you really won't find on YouTube. I mean, this is kind of the, the Cav Arts community. So we will be demoing this. Uh, we, we, it went live February 1st. We're gonna be doing some more teasers with it. We just got so much going on with the live events. I didn't wanna crowd any of this out, but March 2nd, we're gonna do a formal kickoff. Um, Dan is helping us with that, as is Glenn Morris. Is Glenn still on? If he is, thanks. We're looking at kind of a different way to highlight this and maybe do a deep dive on some of the sections that were more personal to us when when we went through and reviewed it. So, Dan, anything, any thoughts on that? I just think, man, it, it's a great expansion to the uh, modules, Paul. Uh, gives a lot more for for the uh, novice guitar player to work with, and I totally agree. You don't have to be you know, somebody has been playing for 10 years to be a writer. Uh, layout in there is is, laid out, is is made to the beginner, to the novice, as well as to the advanced uh, guitar player or guitarist or musician. Uh, I think it, it's a really, really awesome uh, tool. And we had a lot of help from the community. I had five reviewers that, that helped go through it before we turned it on. Um, I won't name them all because I'll forget names, but I, I we kind of went through this testing phase to say, does this seem to make sense? Does the layout work? And so we're getting a lot of good feedback from it. So I'm really excited that we've got some more tools for guitar players that may not need a one-on-one -on -one instructor with us or, or may have already gone through it and want to advance a little bit more. Um, and I, I know a lot of the students that I teach individually by their eighth, ninth lesson, part of what they do is sit down and just they just make things up and they, they're mesmerized with that. They love that. And so this is really a way to kind of say you can do that. And there's some fun ways to get started. One of the things in the very last section, and then I'll, I'll be done, Tom, because I know we're tight on time. Uh, um, Orhe found this for me. It was our friend in Canada with the YouTube channel. Um, Oh, I, he's, he's a big YouTube teacher and Justin, Justin's got a video where he did a live event where he took the chords in the key of C and a dice. He rolled the dice four times, five times, and that was his chord progression. And then on his Instagram account, people were putting lyric phrases. He took a dice and he rolled to get lyrics. And so in this live event, he's creating a song using dice. And it's, it's just kind of another example of kind of a fun way and how you just could get started creating music. It's all about creating some original music now that you got these skills. 
really exciting stuff. I know a number of the community members have have gotten to that point where it's like, well, what do I want to do now? What's what's next on my my guitar journey? And this this player this player's toolkit gives you those options. You can take any road that you want, starting with any of the the modules there, and follow that path. And then when you're ready to move on to the next, there are going to be more paths for you to take. So exciting stuff. That's great, Paul. Thanks for thanks for uh, bringing that to life. I know you've been working on that for months. So um, all right. So here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just let everyone know we've got some upcoming events because I know we're running into overtime here. We've got the Guitar Brigade that's coming up. Um, and that's going to be February 21st, I believe. And if uh, you're, let's see, what's the topic on that one, Paul? Is that? Uh, triads. It's all about triads. Right? So if you have seen in the community, there's a really good discussion where I asked, how do you define a triad? And it looks like we have six or seven folks that are taking a stab at it. Real good. Uh, Real good. So David Kraut and Ken Morlino will be helping uh, facilitate that. All right. And that first one was with blues. And uh, boy, we'd love to get some blues integrated into the iJam play along. That's scheduled on March 7th. And then we've got the next round of the guitar shop coming up on, on March 9th. What I'd like to do right now is just leave you all with uh, Dan's tip of the month. And then uh, once that's done, we'll say our goodbye. So hang on, check this out. It's about a five minute video on what not to do uh, when it comes to storing your guitar. All right, so here we are. I got your tip of the month here on how not to store your guitar. I'll show you various ways on how not to store your guitar. And then at the end of all this, we'll get into how to properly store your guitar so you get a lifetime of enjoyment and pleasure out of your instruments. Here we go. So this is actually backstage in 1969 from a Rolling Stones concert. This is a Rolling Stones dressing room, and you can tell they really care for their instruments. Ladies and gentlemen, this is absolutely not the way to store your guitars. Um, if you got a match, you might have a nice little bonfire. Other than that, not a good idea. Storing your guitar stacked flat like this is not the best way to store your guitar. You always want to have your guitars standing up when you're storing them. Get a case, man. I'm not even going to comment on this one. Is this your practice room? Wall hooks, while being a great way to store your guitar, however, for the long-term storage of your guitar on wall hooks, the jury's still out on that. But this is not a real good utilization of wall hooks. If you're going to use it, use it just for your guitar. And, hey, those acoustic guitars could have been turned around face out. All right, so let's talk about how we really want to store our guitar. The proper way, there are very short-term and long-term ways. And also, we have to worry about temperature and humidity. And there are products available at your local music store online to facilitate that. This is the basic upright adjustable guitar stand. They can get a little more sophisticated. It's going to cost you a little bit more money out of your pocket. And this is the A-frame, the A-frame style. I use them all the time. They're easy, convenient, portable. These are wonderful for around the house or using on a gig. And for those of us with multiple guitars and we're looking for a solution to keep them all in one spot, these are them. You can get them where they'll hold three, five, or seven guitars. They actually fold up to the bass folds up, so it's not too bad for storage. They also come in this type, the suitcase, which is kind of neat. looks like a guitar case. You open it up and you can put your guitars in and store them in here. This is another temporary storage idea. And last but not least, the wall hook. And as we saw earlier, they can be misused and abused. They can be used for everything but putting your guitar on. 
Uh, these can be uh, used in various places around your house. That is, if you like screw holes in your walls. And that's great to display for your friends and family as long as they don't grab the guitars off the wall when you're not looking. I would keep them in a private room, studio, really great to have on hand when you would just want to grab your guitar. Only problem with these, if you leave them long term, they're going to collect dust. And it's also, if you really leave them a long time, they can start to put pressure on the headstock and on the neck because of the weight of the guitar itself. So now for the long-term solutions for storage. The case. The hard case is the best way to store your guitar. It should be stored either on its side or standing straight up. The hard case, great protection for the long haul, even for the short haul. There's various types that are like being shown here where it conforms to the shape of your guitar. You want to guitar case it's got a nice padding on the inside i mean hey your guitar likes luxury you want it to be tight fitting uh, so it doesn't move around a whole lot remember you're going to be keeping it on its side or standing straight up that's the best way to store your guitar and this is the gig bag temporary storage at its best However, you don't want to do a long-term storage in a gig bag unless it's like the last resort. They really are very good for taking to a jam, taking to a gig. You want to have your guitar still laying on its side or standing up. You don't want to stack things on top of it. And they're great for keeping off uh, the occasional beverage spill or uh, keeping dust out of your guitar. All right, Dan. Hey, thanks for that report, my friend. Some good information there. Kathy, hey. really quick, the reason you don't want to lay leave your guitar flat in the case at, or any time is it starts to put strain on where the neck and the body meet, and then uh, it can eventually... It's one of those deals, you know, you could mess up your intonations and check, mess up your uh, action. Whether it, I doubt you would have it severe enough where it would crack the neck, but uh, it's just, you know, really a lot safer to keep your guitar on the side because the way they're built, uh, the way it would lay in the uh, case, that it wouldn't put any strain at that joint especially standing up. I keep all mine standing up. Yeah. Hey, listen, we are, gosh, we are into overtime. We, we are way all, over. Thank you all um, for giving up part of your Saturday to be with us doing the uh, the guitar shop. It's our second time. We got some really good feedback and some, some really helpful hints on trying to uh, throw in some content that's interesting. Please continue to, you know, submit the information to us through the Guitars for Vets Learning Center, just go ahead and drop us a, a message or um, you can reach us at our Guitars for Vets email address as well too. I want to go ahead and thank Randy and Rich, Joel, and of course Paul for uh, for being a part of today's panel. If uh, there are things that you still want to ask, throw it on the, uh, the G4V Learning Center's thread and one of us will get to you. And uh, till next time, uh, I'm Tom Wilmog for Guitars for Vets. We will see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Yeah.